If you have your Bibles, you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, we'll be looking at verses 14 through 15 as we continue on looking at the armor of God from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 through 15. And this is the Word of God to the people of God. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And this is the word of God to the people of God. You. you may be seated. If I were totally honest with you this morning, I would have to say I don't enjoy spiritual warfare. I really don't. I, I can oftentimes see the battles coming. I know that I'm in the battle, but I don't get a lot of joy out of it. I don't get a lot of joy out of it. It's usually the time when I am struggling in one way or another. But I would also say that I tend to find security and comfort in my spiritual complacency. You know, it's kind of like when you get comfortable where you're at and you don't want to move and you're kind of like glad you're kind of being left alone for a little while and everything seems to be going really good and I get very complacent. I like that place. I really do like that place. It, it really does affirm me very, very well. I, I like that. But there is nothing more appealing to the sinful nature of man than to embrace the idea that the status quo of our spiritual journey is sufficient when it comes to our sanctification. As a matter of fact, without those battles, I probably would not continue on in the journey of my sanctification on my own. I'm usually being sanctified when I'm being challenged. This will only, in the end, stifle our growth when we are comfortable in our complacency. It will stifle our growth and promote self-reliance in the life of the Christian. This is why spiritual warfare is helpful to a degree. Nothing like being in over your head to remind us of our weakness and our need for God's provision in our lives. You see, when things are going well, I'm very self-sufficient. Oh, I, I know, I've been to seminary. Pastor, even you, you've been to seminary, Bible college. Yes, all of that. But there still is the fleshly desire that I struggle with just like you do. And I get comfortable in that place of complacency. And I like that place. I don't like being challenged. I don't like the idea of spiritual warfare being helpful. But when the warfare comes and I realize that I'm not going to make it in and of myself, it calls me to call out to God. It calls me to abandon self-reliance. To find my strength in Him alone. This is why we need the armor of God in order to stand firm against the evil one in the day of the battle. And this armor begins with the belt of truth. Look back at your text to the first half of verse 14. We see these words, Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. You see, the soldier's belt was useful to hold his garments in place so that during battle the garments wouldn't restrict or hinder him when he fought. The belt was a very important piece of the armor. Oftentimes we don't think about that so much, that a belt being important to a warrior, but it was. The soldier's belt was also foundational to his armor. This is because other pieces of the armor would attach to the belt in order to support the weight by resting uh, on the soldier's hips. I once owned a backpack, you know, one of those things you put on when you go hiking. And I remember years ago having one that 
was just, you know, had shoulder straps on it. And when you hiked and you had a heavy load in that backpack, that your shoulders became, uh, well, very painful after a while. And right in the middle of the back, it started to hurt and you couldn't get comfortable. But then someone told me, oh, you need one of those backpacks that's got the belt around it. And I went and I found one of those um, backpacks at a garage sale, got a great deal on it did have a little hole in it, but that didn't matter. And, and I put that on next time I went hiking. And that belt around the backpack actually supported the weight. And all the shoulder straps did was just hold the backpack against my back. But the weight was around my hips. And it wasn't painful to wear at all. I could endure a whole lot more. In this case, the belt of the Christian's armor is truth. Truth is belted around us. Truth is crucial when it comes to spiritual warfare because truth is what informs us regarding the nature of our battle and the means by which we fight and stand victorious in the end. Truth actually contextualizes the whole of the Christian life. But this is not a relative or subjective idea of truth that Paul is talking about here. Paul instead has in mind the absolute truth of the Word of God. You see, the Christian soldier can't find, can't find truth of this nature being conveyed by the modern day culture because we live in a postmodern culture today. It's interesting that even like that old hymn that we sang, uh, that the, Na the Navy's theme song, uh, uh, when uh, Susan asked me about it, she said, hey, what do you think about these words? I said, well, I can see how we could sing it in church. I just don't know how the Navy could sing it today. Because it was so theologically rich and so sound in accordance with biblical truth. You see, there was a time when that was very critical for us as a nation, as a society, and as a culture. But today, it is not the case at all. Things have changed. And you may have noticed. This truth is not a subjective truth, meaning that it's not a truth that comes from the self. It's not something that you promote in and of yourself. It is a truth that comes to us from God. That's what Paul has in mind. We live in a postmodern culture today where truth at best is only considered to be a subjective set of ideas relative to individual preferences or it is just a collective social construct of the majority. Many believe that the church should just follow the culture in our day. And we should accommodate the culture in order to stay relevant in the world. This is where we need to understand something very crucial, Christian. The church doesn't get its certification of relevancy from the world. Let me say that again. The church does not get its certification of relevancy from the world. They're not going to like us. And they're not going to like what we say and what we proclaim and what we believe. They're not going to because they have a whole different agenda than the church does in the world. We don't get our certification of relevancy from the world. The relevancy of the church in the world is by divine appointment. And the message and purpose of the church is ordained by Almighty God. The critical need for the belt of truth never goes away because there is no stand to be taken without it. As the Apostle Paul tells us to stand therefore, he's understanding that there is a biblical truth that we need to understand regarding the battle that we're in and that the enemy will come. The, the devil will sling his arrows at us. But we are to stand, therefore, because we have no power in and of ourselves. We are to stand, therefore, in the power of God and the provisions that He has for us in Christ. You see, without truth, we have no measure or standard by which to expose falsehood. Without truth, we do not have a guide that we can trust to inform us of our individual and corporate identity as the body of Christ regarding our mission and our purpose in the world. 
Truth does not have its origins in humanity at the individual nor the corporate level. That would be a subjective idea of truth relative to the self and those you can convince to go along with you. Real objective truth has its origins in God and everyone is subject to him and to the absolute objectivity of his truth. And you say, well, why does God get to call all the shots? Because he made everything, including every person who has ever lived. He's the one who created the universe. He made the earth. He made the world. He created it all, proclaimed it as very good. Man and his disobedience fell into sin. God is the one who will hold man accountable in the end according to his objective truth. Without God's revelation of himself and his truth in the scriptures, all of us would be powerless under the dominion of the father of lies, none other than the devil. Jesus told us this when he spoke to the Pharisees in John chapter 8, 43 through 45. The Word of God says this, Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. The world doesn't want to hear the truth today. It's just like it was in Jesus' day with the Pharisees. John's Gospel also tells us that Christ is the Word of God, having taken on flesh, John 1, 14, He dwelt among us. He is the embodiment of truth. Truth is an attribute at the core of the character of God Himself, just like lies is an attribute of the evil one at the core of the devil himself. God is the one who possesses truth. Fallen man rejects truth because he rejects the God of the Bible. If we do not have truth, then we do not have the one true God. We have a false God created by our own subjective ideas. And the way this looks is that people usually think of the idea or concept of the Christian God in America, but then they take away what the Bible clearly says about the Christian God, and then they start attaching all kinds of different ideas to that God promoting that as being his character, and actually what you end up with in the end is a God of your own imagination, because such a God is tantamount to being an idol fashioned by our own imaginations and is of no difference to the Pharisees of old. You see, they wanted a God that fit their own expectations and desires and a God who affirmed them in their selfish ambitions and nothing has changed in 2,000 years. The prideful nature of man feels most at home in the sufficiency of the self and it will show in how necessary one deems the Word of God to be for the Christian life. And when I say that, I'm not talking about a verse a day keeps the devil away kind of thing. You know, where you read your little verse on your little devotional and you say, oh, that's nice. It's usually lifted out of context and the commentary on it, you know, gives you some warm, fuzzy feelings, uh, warm, fuzzy words for you to feel as you read it. And I've had Christians over and over through the years have come to me and say, you know, Pastor Brett, I decided when I was reading my devotional, I would start looking it up in the Bible and reading the context and Lo and behold, I mean, I don't know if you know this or not, Pastor Brett, but, but many of those verses do not mean what people say they mean. Did you know that? I said, yeah, I knew that. I knew that. Sells books, makes us feel good, but at the end of the day, it's just a cliche type of Christianity. A verse a day keeps the devil away. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about eating the Word like food is to the body. When you're hungry, what do you want? You want something to eat. 
You want something to eat. And I remember over the last week when I was in Jackson, Mississippi with Audrey taking her down to the college and as we were driving down the road and we get right there around noontime, I'd, I'd ask her, I'd say, I'd say, are you hungry? And she, sometimes she would say, well, not really. I was so hoping she'd say yes because I was getting hungry. And, and we would stop and we would eat. And, and, but in hunger, as I was thinking, I need something to eat. I'm hungry. Um, th- that's what made me want to stop. Well, it's the same way when it comes to the Word of God. When you understand that the Word of God is life to you. You want to eat it because it's going to feed you. It's going to help you. It's going to grow you. It's going to nurture you in the things of God. You want to eat. You want to take to the Scriptures like you take food when you're hungry. We eat in order to live the Christian life and to stay healthy in the Christian life. It is out of absolute necessity and need that we eat. And it is out of absolute necessity that we buckle up for the battle because without truth, there is no readiness for spiritual warfare And there is no support for our armor, the armor of God in our battle. And this includes the breastplate of righteousness. Look at the second half of verse 14. We see these words, And having put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate, this was a protective covering over the vital organs of a soldier. And most critical was the heart of the soldier. This righteousness is not an inherent righteousness that comes from a person, nor is it derived from a person's good works. Because as we all know, Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6 reminds us that all of our good works are like filthy rags. Kent R. Hughes in his work on Ephesians chapter 6 14 says this. He says, filthy rags form a futile breastplate. Filthy rags form a futile breastplate. A futile breastplate. We have no righteousness of our own. This righteousness depicted by the breastplate is an imputed righteousness. It's imputed to us by God through faith in Christ. Theologians call it an alien righteousness. It's not because it came here on a spaceship from outer space. It's not because of any of that. that. It has no association with sci-fi whatsoever. It's alien because it's not of us. It is something outside of us. It comes to us from God. It is a righteousness that is given to us, imputed, paid to our account. And that is the righteousness that the Apostle Paul is talking about here in our text. It is impossible to wear this breastplate of this righteousness in confidence of your own self-reliance. It's impossible. When you put on the righteousness of God in Christ, there is no self-reliance in that security that you have because that righteousness is not yours. The breastplate of righteousness is antithetical to the idea and notion of self-reliance. It is grace alliance at that point. You are not relying upon yourself, but you are relying upon what God has provided for you through Christ. It's impossible to wear this breastplate in confidence of your own self-reliance. Without faith in God's provision of righteousness to us through faith in Christ, the devil will manipulate us into a performance-based pursuit of salvation or into a personal absolution of moral failure to subside feelings of guilt. And what do I mean by those two statements? Well, you will pursue 
uh, assurance from God through doing your work, doing good deeds, doing moral good deeds, and instead of finding your approval from God because you are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the devil will use this idea that you can perform your way to God and you can pursue salvation by works as a way of moving you away from the assurance and the power of the breastplate of righteousness. That's what he'll do. I've seen it over and over again in my own life. I've seen it in the lives of other Christians. I've seen it in the lives of those who are not Christians and people of other religions pursue uh, this whole idea of thinking that they can somehow work their way into God's approval or into a personal absolution of moral failure. This is where you come to the place of forgiving yourself as being the primary means of your assurance. And I think, you know, when you, when you uh, talk about people who have been abused, things like that, and people who are wrestling and battling with sin, uh, I always uh, am aware that there are people who have come to the understanding of God's forgiveness, but then have this overwhelming sense of the weight of feeling their guilt and shame and not coming to terms with God's forgiveness for them. I'm not talking about that. That's a battle that we can have, certainly. But what I'm talking about is people who reject the notion or idea that Christ has paid for our debt and that we can somehow uh, uh, put Christ aside and that we can just uh, pursue uh, moral righteousness in such a way as to make up for our bad mistakes. So you kind of put yourself on a balancing scale. I hope that my good works outweigh my bad works. And since I believe that they do, I'm going to absolve myself of uh, any condemnation and just know that I'm going to go to heaven because I do good works. The enemy will use this to, again, move you away from the reality of what Christ has done for us. You see, even the moral law written on the heart of man is enough to bring conviction to the hearts of fallen man and produce guilt in the moral conscience. I've seen this when I used to go to the jail, and I would go into the jail and preach to, to guys, and oftentimes they would only look at their, uh, their life from a moralistic standpoint. And they would often tell me, I know I've done wrong. I know I've done wrong. I know that when I took those drugs or I, you know, was drunk when I got behind the wheel or, you know, I shoplifted from Walmart or when I robbed that person's garage, I knew that what I was doing was wrong. But these people, they, they don't have any kind of idea what Christianity is really all about. They just know that it's wrong. I remember asking these guys the question, so what would you do if you went back from this time here with me and you went back to your cell and you found out that someone had gotten into your things while you were gone and stole your toothbrush? And a couple of them said, oh man, we'd be ready. We'd be ready to take them out back. I said, yes, of course you would. Because you understand the reality of morality on the conscience. You see, you don't even have to know the Bible to know that stealing is wrong. It's, it's where the old saying comes, there's honor among thieves. It's because they even know. And I told these guys, I said, you guys could be in here for shoplifting at Walmart, stealing, and yet you would be ready to hold somebody accountable for stealing your toothbrush. And they'd get it. You know, when I'd say that, they'd be, ah, <laughs> Boy, that's true. That's the way we are. And I tell them it's because God has written his law on your heart. You know that stealing is wrong. You know that murder is wrong. You know that basic Christian morality. You understand it because it's already been written on your heart. 
People know this. Even atheists will sit and tell you that murder is wrong. When you ask them why, that's when they start having problems. You see, if you are not suited up with the breastplate of the righteousness of God in Christ, the devil will use your guilt from your sin, from the moral law, either written in your heart or if your mom or your grandparents taught you or you went to scunning school when you were a kid and you heard the moral law, it, it will all come to bear upon your life. The devil would use your guilt from your sin to pound you into the ground. Some years ago, I had a man who came to me and he says, I'm afraid, Pastor Brett, I'm getting ready to be laid off from my job. He had worked there for about 25 years and the company was laying off and he thought he would be laid off from his job. And I said, well, man, you've been there 25 years. I don't think they'll be laying you off. He says, yeah, I'm, I think that... Uh, that I'm getting ready to be laid off because, uh, because God is getting ready to punish me for my things I've done in my past. And this guy really believed this, and he told me that he knew this was getting ready to happen to him. And he, he actually pursued an adulterous relationship, but before he went into adultery, he was already pursuing this other woman. The, the elders of the church got wind of it, and the wife got wind of it, and they all you know, circled the wagons around him and tried to hold him accountable. And he decided to submit to accountability instead of being uh, disciplined by the church. And he did not go into adultery. But yet because of his heart and the way it was at that time, he was sure this was God coming to punish him for what he had done. This demonstrated to me a blind spot when it came to understanding the gospel. And I remember that I was sharing with this man. I said, no, I don't think it has anything to do with your sin 25 years ago. I think it has everything to do with the economic situation and what's going on in the world and, and in our region. That's what I think it's all about. And I said, you need to understand that when Christ died on the cross, he was fully aware of every sin that you would ever commit, even before you were ever born. And he died in your place to take that sin away from you. And when, and when Christ has forgiven you, you no longer have to walk in the shame and the guilt of your sin. You can rest in the assurance of knowing that. And you will not receive God's wrath upon you because of that. And I'm not denying the idea that sometimes God uses our experiences in life to chastise us. He does certainly, and to bring us back to himself. But this was something that was, has been long since gone from this man's life. This man did not understand what it meant to wear the breastplate of the righteousness of God in Christ. The Christian warrior must have the protection of the righteousness of God in Christ. And that man that I'm talking about did not lose his job. He continued on. And Christian, you can't go into battle wearing the breastplate of the righteousness of God in Christ barefoot. You can't. Even if you're from Kentucky, you can't do this. The shoes must theologically match. Look at verse 15. Back at your text, the shoes of readiness. Verse 15. And his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. The shoes have to theologically match. When I got to this place and I understood this and what Paul is saying, I couldn't help but think of Mr. Womack. Womack is a very sharp dresser. I mean, if we did, you know, best dressed, he'd get the best dressed guy of all of us. And I love it when he walks up to me and he's so sharp. And I'm, I'm not trying to embarrass him at all. He is a sharp dressed man. And, and his shoes often match his suit. Most always. And he has told me about how important it is. 
told me that. And you know, I'm a little that way too. That's where I, why I wear a lot of black because black goes with everything, Mr. Womack. But if you look at Mr. Womack, sometimes his, his, his shoes and, and his uh, suit match perfectly. Same design and everything. That's the way it is for the Christian warrior. The shoes have to match theologically with truth and the breastplate of righteousness. In this case, you must have your belt and shoes on first to be able to put on the breastplate. The truth of the gospel of peace is what gives us our readiness, Christian If you are not a believer, you are not ready to go into battle against the evil one. But then there's that irony of Paul's statement that needs to be resolved. How is it that we're talking about spiritual warfare and part of the armor is characterized by peace? Well, the warfare is against the devil. But the peace is the peace that we have with God due to all that the gospel has done on our behalf. It is the gospel that puts a position of security, a place to stand. The gospel, the work of Christ, is the fortress around us for spiritual warfare. The warfare is against the devil. The peace is with God through all that the gospel has done. For us through Christ. If God does not open your eyes to the reality of the gospel, then you are held captive under the devil's dominion. And as such, you are under the just wrath of God. And the devil is not a being that you are fighting, but the devil is actually your master, and you are under his dominion. Now, let me say something to you, Christian. Trying to. What we often do in spiritual warfare is we focus on the battle as the priority, and then we see the priority of the battle, and then we, we look through kind of that lens of the battle and we see Christ. That's wrong. That's not the way we, that's not the way to do it. We are to have the priority of Christ and we're to look through Christ, our Christology, and see the battle. It's not the battle that's the priority. It's Christ that is the priority and the battle is understood in light of the supremacy and the power of Christ. There's a difference to that. You're getting the cart before the horse if you make the priority the battle. It's not the battle that's the priority. It is Christ that is the priority. Everything that he has provided for us. So when we're in the battle, we don't need to see the big battle. We need to see the big Christ. We need to see the big Christ who's able to handle the battle for us. If we look at the battle, I guarantee you the enemy will use that to build fear and unbelief in your heart and your life. You have to see Christ in all His glory, His majesty, His power, His dominion. And you have to look at Him primarily. And you have to see your battle in light of who your God is. You understand the difference? You can't see the battle and be overwhelmed by it and then look to Christ because you're probably going to be overshadowed by the battle and focusing on that in panic and not seeing the reality of who your God is. And you say, how do you know that, Pastor Brett? Because you read books on it? Well, I've read books on it. But I can tell you that my tendency when I'm in the battle is to see how big the battle is. I'm one of those guys that likes to worry. If you're one of those people, you probably are going to always look at how big the battle is. God gave me a wife who looks at the big God. And so when I'm talking to her often about the battle, the battle doesn't seem to rattle her. 
And that bothers people who worry. It bothers people who worry. And if you're married to someone like that, it's not uncommon for God to put two people like that together because you balance each other out. It takes me a while to get to where she is. Usually I have to spin everything out of my mouth. I have to say it all. She just sits there and listens. And then when it's all over and I'm done, I'm exhausted, I'm ready to go to bed, she's like, she gives me like two sentences and like puts everything in perspective. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I don't like it that, that I tend to worry. I, I don't like that anxiety that I feel. But, but I've, I've done this long enough to know that, that the reason I'm that way is because I tend to look at the battle as the big thing instead of God being the big thing. One is a practice in unbelief. The other one is life and faith. Know the difference. That subtle little adjustment in the way you think, the way you look at life, will liberate you when the battle comes. It'll give you strength and security to be able to stand on the evil day. Keep your focus on how great and awesome your God is. You know why I preach this way? You know why when we get together as the people of God, we sing about the greatness and glory of our God? We do that because we understand something. We understand that the battle belongs to the Lord. We understand that even though we may be we may feel like we're being chased down by Pharaoh's army and we're backed up against the water. We understand that we have a God who is able to part the water. He's big. We understand that even when you're told to be quiet and not pray to your God like the, the three Hebrew children, or we're going to throw you in the fiery furnace. They just pray on. And I love the way they answered Nebuchadnezzar when they went to throw him in. Our God will deliver us, and even if he don't, we are not going to stop praying and giving him the glory. That is the way the Christian has got to live in a secular world. It is the way that the church needs to think. That the church needs to, to think that way Christologically, theologically, like, like it's the air that we're breathing. You see, you must be set free. God has not opened your eyes. You must be set free from that prison of bondage and liberated from the dominion of darkness by God through the gospel of peace. And you know what? God and his gospel is the only one who is able, the only means that God has even created to be able to open the eyes of the blind. God is the only one who can set you free by the power of the Holy Spirit the German poet and novelist Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, he made this observation about human nature. I don't know how much of a theologian he was or if he was even a believer, but this is something he said about human nature. He said, none are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. None are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. You see, this is one of the greatest spiritual deceptions regarding human bondage. Man can be free from a political perspective. We've talked about it a little bit this morning, thanking God for it. Man can be free from a political perspective. 
while at the same time spiritually being in bondage. But if you're not a believer, I have good news of great liberty for you today. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. All the way down to the core of their being. It is a spiritual deception to not come to terms with the reality of your bondage to sin. Jesus Christ came into the world to liberate you from the spiritual bondage of sin and death and to set you free from the tyranny of the devil. Unbeliever, knowing you are in spiritual bondage is a prerequisite to being free. Understand, I'm not here to make you like me this morning. If you're not a believer, my primary objective is not to have you like Pastor Brett, think I'm a nice It's not it. I love you too much for that. My objective this morning is that God would open your eyes to see the reality of bondage and your need for His quickening power to work in your life. Or you can't have the belt of truth. Or you can't have the breastplate of righteousness. You can't have the shoes of the readiness of the gospel of peace on your feet. You can't stand against the evil one on the evil day. You need a Savior. You need a Savior. You need to put your faith in Christ to trust in Him by grace through faith alone that you may be liberated from the bondage of your sin. Believe the gospel, my friend. Trust in the finished work of Christ. Christian, if you are sitting here within the sound of my voice, you have been liberated. And Christ has secured you to God. It is the Holy Spirit that liberated you and empowers you to live for God and His glory. Every time, Christian, you hear the gospel, you should never think, here it goes again. Same message I've heard over and over again. If that's you, you're not going to like heaven. Because in heaven, that's all it's going to be about. Celebrating Christ and everything He has done for us. The gospel is everything. When you hear the gospel, Christian, your ears should perk up. You should tune your heart. And remember, thanks be to God that He has worked His work of grace in my life. It is my security. It is my foundation. It is the place by which I stand. It is my whole livelihood. It is everything for me. That's what the gospel is. Play it again. <laughs> Sing it again. Preach it again. Let us hear the old, old story. Tell it again. Over and over and over. Let's hear it again. Speak to my heart, O oh God. Call me away from self-sufficiency that I might root myself in Christ and stand, having done all to stand, stand therefore girded with truth with the plate of righteousness before me, with my feet shod, with the gospel of grace. Memorial Day is the day we remember those who died to secure our political freedom in America. But as we reflect on that, even tomorrow, and as we talked about it today, what they did in laying their life down for our political freedom reflects something far greater. Far greater. Something that only God can do that has eternal implications where our ultimate liberty for all of eternity has been purchased by Christ and His death and His resurrection from the dead. 
You see, with Christ, there's something very different than all those soldiers who have gone before us. So you can go to Arlington Cemetery, and I've seen Arlington Cemetery on a drive-by secondary road. I didn't have time to visit it, but I saw the hillsides with white crosses. And I want to tell you something. When I saw it, I was moved. I was moved. It is an, I mean, just what I saw was an awesome display. And my heart was moved. I couldn't help but well up with tears and, you know, patriotic pride well up in my heart and being so thankful to God. And there's all those crosses. And there are all those crosses, what do they do? They represent the bodies of those who are buried there. The remains. But if you go to the tomb of Christ, you know what you will find? It's empty. <laughs> it's empty. Because only God can destroy the works of the devil and give us the kind of liberty that will go for eternity. You see, with Christ, he rose from the dead on the third day. And this is how we know that death is not our Death will not keep us Death will not hold us. Rest in Christ this morning, Christian. Confess your sin and trust in Him. May His grace be sufficient for us. And may we stand in His armor. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for the armor. Forgive us for the times when we manipulated by our own fear. Manipulated by our own fear, Lord. We make the battle so big that it seems overwhelming to us. And we oftentimes look through the eyes of our fear to you. We see the battle as the priority, as the emphasis. But in reality, the greatness and glory of all that you have decreed Christ to be for us is everything. I pray that your gospel, Lord, would work deep into our hearts today, that we would see Christ greater more glorious, bigger, more awesome, exercising more dominion and power than we could ever even imagine. That our faith would remain firm, strong, because we have a big God. And Lord, as the evil one would scream loudly regarding our problems, and would try to destroy us and lead us astray and manipulate us and cause us to look to the problem or the battle instead of looking to the glory and greatness of Christ. I pray that even there that you would convict us and call us back that we would see Christ as more glorious in all things. Lord, may your Holy Spirit work that in us. May you grow us in our faith. May you help us to be witnesses, Lord, not just in what we say, but in how we live in this way, that those that we encounter may see the difference. And know, Lord, that there is something different about how we live in this fallen world than how the world lives. May Christ be exalted in our lives. And Lord, if there be anyone here today who does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray that today may be the day that their eyes may be opened to the truth of the gospel, that they may be saved. 
Lord, do your work. Open the eyes of the blind that they may see. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace to us. Thank you for the security that we have. Thank you for the triumph that we, even though we might have it in this world, we know ultimately we have everlasting liberty in Christ. Thank you, O God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.